Hey everyone, it's Ivan, kipadger.com, here today to share with you the story of rifle number 301 by Sawtooth Rifles. Before we dive into this rifle, a little bit about the genesis of this entire project. One of my buddies over at Q, Mitch, one of the engineers, he actually kind of took the lead on designing the side check. If you're unfamiliar, it is a chassis. You can drop in a Remington 700 action, free float, folding stock, all that goodness. It's pretty cool, lightweight, really lightweight for chassis. And so I ended up with this lightweight chassis. And I said, well, I should probably make a gun. But here's the thing, 2020, everyone in the world makes a better Remington 700 than Remington. So I didn't really want a Remington 700 barrel action. So I actually ended up reaching out to the guys over at Gunworks, ended up with a Gunworks action, then called my buddy, Michael, over at Criterion Barrels, and I said, hey, this is kind of what I'm looking for, because big picture, decided I want to make a bolt gun for my son. Custom bolt gun, so we could go out and take game. So decided on a six millimeter barrel that was going to get chambered in 243. I know, 243, it's not the new hotness, but here's the thing. It has killed pretty much everything, completely capable, low recoil impulse, and on top of that, no matter where you go, like little like Ace hardware in the middle of nowhere that has a little gun counter or doesn't have a gun counter, you can buy 243 ammo, super prolific. So started putting things together, and then I need to find someone to build this. When it comes to finding a gunsmith to build a custom bolt gun, started kind of looking around and I don't know, like what, what is the yardstick? How many guns someone's built, who shoots their guns? So to that end, ended up talking with Matt from Sawtooth Rifles, said, hey, here's a project I would like to do and here's what I have going. Knowing going into it that there were some, there were some hurdles that were gonna need to be overcome and kind of explained them and he's like, yeah, yeah, we could do that. So I was like, all right, sounds good. Hopped in the car, burned like 11 hours straight down to Salt Lake City. Sawtooth Rifles is no longer located in the Sawtooth Mountains. It has moved a number of times, but made it down there and spent the next two days grinding out Rifle 301. As a quick aside, if you're unfamiliar with Matt and Sawtooth Rifles, does incredible work. And I guess speaking to the level of his work, some of the shooters that shoot his rifles, such as Scott Satterley, incredibly talented shooter, had the opportunity to train with him a while back out at Rock Lake Rifle Range. Encourage you to check out that video. Incredibly talented guy and continually competitive in PRS. And the other thing that is pretty cool about Matt is he's a practitioner. Yes, he's an engineer. Yes, he's a gunsmith. And yes, he shoots PRS puts in time with the stuff that he builds and works on, which is pretty cool. So set out down there to get started on Rifle 301. If you're wondering what this Rifle 301 thing is about, Matt has made a lot of rifles, exactly 300 before this one, the 301st that he's made. I'm talking custom rifles, not rebarreling, cutting, threading, all that other gunsmith stuff, but 300 custom rifles, and then this one. So went down there and took inventory of what we were working with. At the heart of the gun is a Gunworks GLR stainless steel short action. For the barrel, I'm using a Criterion barrel, a 20 inch barrel blank knowing it was going to be cut down probably around 17 inches, made of 416R stainless steel, using a heavy sporter contour. One and eight twist for heavier loads, and again, six millimeter barrel to be chambered in 243 Winchester. For the trigger, I had a CMC drop-in, flat face trigger. And all of this would go into the Q side chick chassis to include the big butt pad since it was gonna be my son shooting it and anything to reduce the recoil a little bit more for him, just make it a more pleasant time shooting. And lastly, the cherry on top, Q 
Hughes Cherry Bomb. At that point, knowing what we were working with, Matt got started. First things first, paperwork. Incredibly meticulous. Matt went through and weighed every individual piece and component of the rifle before we even started. Taking note of the model to include how much the barrel weighed, the twist, where it came from, head stamp, all of that stuff. Going through, documenting all of it. You told me beforehand that he had never worked with a Gunworks action. And so some actions are pretty much the same with respect to thread pitch, everything like that for like Remington 700, like barrels go back and forth. Gunworks was a little bit different. So started out taking a lot of measurements. And then as those measurements were taken, basically putting them into a 3D modeler and trying to figure out and basically write a program for cutting the threads for the barrel so they would mate up with the action. To include one of the kind of nuanced places where the bolt face actually interfaces with the barrel. And of course, since we only had one barrel to work with, went ahead and tested it on basically a piece of stock steel. Same type of steel the barrel was made out of, that stainless steel, and went ahead, drilled out a hole, and went to work with the program on the lathe, getting it threaded to see if it would fit the action. Once he was sure that the action actually fit onto the barrel, which is what we were looking for, went ahead and made sure the bolt actually fit as well. So that's with the bolt back against the lugs and then pushing the slot forward. Two thousands? Yep. Having now confirmed that the program works, the action threads on to the barrel, our test barrel. It's time to get the real barrel ready. So for that, ended up taking our barrel over to this massive ancient bandsaw made in like the 1950s and went ahead and cut off the stamp on the end, basically giving them a nice clean surface to work on. Next, which was pretty crazy to see, was him threading the muzzle. Not the outside, but the inside. Using a drill and then going ahead and actually put in some threads in there. While it seems totally unconventional, it'll make sense later. It was then time to get the barrel set up in the lathe and centered, which is a massive process unto itself. But before that can happen, you need to basically get this guide rod in there. So to get the guide rod in, you need essentially some kind of shims to make sure it is truly centered in the middle of the six millimeter barrel. So after testing a couple different ones, found the one that was right and had the guide rod centered inside the barrel. Next came the process of getting the barrel centered on two axes, basically moving the tool back and forth, taking measurements, as well as spinning it on that guide rod. And then once that was essentially to his satisfaction, it was time to take the real measurements. Those were actually taken inside of the barrel. The instrument was inserted into the barrel and it would actually measure going up and then down over the lands and then down into the grooves. These measurements were taken both right there at the like, closest entrance to the barrel and then deeper in, back and forth, until it was finally known to be centered. With the barrel centered in the lathe, finally time to get work cutting some metal. First order of business was to square that thing off. Bandsaw cut it, not to say it didn't do a good job, but you need to start with a true known. So initially squared off the end of the barrel. Next step was to turn down the diameter of the barrel to the diameter of the threads, removing as much material as needed so that it was ready to be threaded. And of course, checking along the way to make sure dimensions were correct. After that, it was time to finally cut the threads. Yeah. 
And lastly, ensuring that the action fit. Going ahead and threading it on, making sure there weren't any rough spots, nothing high, everything going on smooth. Next, Matt ended up roughing out what would be the chamber with the drill bit. Basically removing some metal so there wouldn't be as much work for the reamer to actually do. Then the bolt face was cut. as well as a relief behind the threads. And before moving on, the bore was once again cleaned out. The next part was honestly pretty cool. If at first you're wondering like, what is this guy doing with this hand drill in the muzzle of this barrel? Well, now you'll see what was going on. So Matt ended up taking these fixtures that were attached to cutting fluid and threading them into those threads he had made in the muzzle of the barrel. This in turn would allow cutting fluid to pass through the barrel and push all the material cut by the reamer back out. And of course, documenting everything along the way. He'd actually never chambered a 243 and this reamer was brand new. So first thing he needed to do was get a guide piece. Again, making sure the reamer stayed centered inside the barrel. And then work on affixing it and aligning it on the lathe, because we only had one barrel. Seeing the chamber on this barrel being cut was pretty rad. It was really cool watching, basically, that reamer slowly work into the barrel, and all that cutting fluid just continue to push through the barrel and push out little bits of flake as it would cut, and just keep going, keep going, keep going, till it was finally getting close to the depth. Occasionally, he would stop and check the chamber with a go gauge. And in doing so, take measurements that he would check against other measurements he had previously made, making sure he was cutting to the appropriate depth, but not too much. And then cutting a little bit more all the way to the appropriate depth. After which, he threaded the action on and tried the no-go gauge. Fortunately, it did not go right there in the sweet spot. And to confirm, ended up taking a piece of solder and putting it on the bolt face behind the go gauge, and then going ahead and seating the bolt with that go gauge in front of it. He was then able to remove the bolt and take that little piece of solder that had smashed in there and measure it, measuring 3.3 thousandths. That was the tolerance. Then Matt ended up cross-hatching or kind of roughing up the chamber a tiny bit so that it wasn't completely super mirror polish, basically giving the brass something to kind of stick to. And wanting to make sure everything was good to go, ended up scoping the barrel. At that point, satisfied at his work, ended up putting a aluminum cap we had previously machined onto the threads to protect them and remove the barrel. The gun was then threaded back into the action, not torqued, but threaded in so that it could be mocked up in the side chick chassis and we could get a proper barrel measurement to see what it needed to be cut to. What we landed on was about 17 inches, so the muzzle brake would be right past the handguard, still allowing us for to put a suppressor on, but at the same time not being overly long. Next order of business was to fire up that bandsaw and cut off that end section of the barrel that he'd previously threaded so that he could actually push that cutting fluid through it. Then came the task of recentering that barrel in the lathe. Again, the entire procedure going back through until finally finding those lands and grooves and knowing it was in fact center after taking two different measurements at different depths inside the barrel in those grooves. Since he needed to start with a known good, he went ahead and squared off the end of the barrel that he'd previously cut with that bandsaw. Next came reducing the diameter and adding the taper. He did this through a program he had wrote, basically turning that barrel down to what the thread dimension was gonna be and then adding the taper at the end for the cherry bomb to go ahead and made up to. Next, the threads were cut onto the barrel. 
stopping occasionally to take measurements and eventually use a gauge, make sure that threads were in fact true all the way back. And finally, test fitting the cherry bomb. Once he was satisfied with the threads, Matt then went ahead and finished the barrel crown by hand. And to double check his crown work, ended up checking it with a cotton swab, basically pulling it out because if there's any little minute burr or anything like that, it would grab the cotton. After that came more documentation. Matt reweighed the barrel and after that work was done to it, cut off about six or seven ounces. Next, both ends of the barrel were capped. Any oil that was on it was cleaned off with some brake cleaner. It was time to bead blast the barrel. that right there ended the first full day's work that went into building rifle 301. At that point it was late, we were both tired, it was time to take a break. Be sure to join me as we continue the story of rifle 301 next time where we start to get into honestly the crux of this entire thing. But as always thanks for joining us at kitbadger.com. Look forward to seeing you next time.